We're, uh, we're delighted uh, to see so many of you here this evening. Uh, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Chris Byrer, and I'm the director of the Duke Global Health Institute. I've been in that uh, position for about 18 months, and it has been really a, a great honor, uh, extraordinary opportunity to serve this great community. Uh, this evening, uh, I'm happy to say we're having the seventh Victor Zhao, uh, Victor and Ruth Zhao, uh, distinguished lecture in global Global health, and also to say uh, that for the first time, it's only going to happen once every hundred years. This is the Duke Centennial, and this event is officially part of the Centennial. So uh, <laughs> that's a really nice thing, and you will see uh, some of the banners and information in the back about uh, the Centennial uh, for this uh, this extraordinary university. Um, I want to thank you all for attending, uh, and, and I want to particularly thank uh, the Duke Global Health Institute staff uh, and the faculty, but particularly our staff who have been working incredibly hard to pull this event together and also the visit uh, of, uh, of our special guests and, and of course also of Adam Silver. We're so happy he's here. Uh, I tell you what, scheduling these two people to be in the same room at the same time uh, with myself, it's an Olympian feat <laughs> and, uh, and I really appreciate uh, all the work that went into that uh, on everybody's staff side. Um, I also want to uh, uh, offer a special welcome and greeting uh, to the Duke alum uh, who are here, the DGHI alum who are here. We have a very strong uh, alumni presence, of course, in the Triangle uh, with with the Research Triangle uh, Institute, with with Research Triangle Park, and of course uh, with that other university with the School of Public Health that's also <laughs> happens to be uh, in Durham, North Carolina, uh, or at least in uh, Chapel Hill. Uh, and so it's wonderful to have you all here and, and welcome you this evening. Um, I want to also um, say a little bit something about uh, the person who has really, or the couple who have really made this uh, event uh, um, possible and, and continue to support it, and that is uh, Victor and Ruth Zhao. So uh, they're here with us tonight, and... Uh I think probably everybody knows, but maybe some of the students uh, aren't aware that um, that Victor Zhao is the Chancellor Emeritus of Duke, uh, and that he also played a really fundamental role in the founding of this institute. Um, and uh, so very much uh, somebody who we all look to uh, as one of the leading uh, thinkers, uh, leading uh, voices in, in, in our field. And of course, he now serves as president of the National Academy of Medicine, uh, which is an incredibly uh, uh, important role and in institution. Um, Mary Klopman and I are members of the same class <laughs> of the National Academy, and uh, wonderful to have you here as well, uh, Mary. Um, and that, um, I think, captures most of the thank yous. Again, I want to I want to thank all of you for being here with us this evening uh, for the Zhao lecture. Uh, and now it's really uh, an honor and a pleasure uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, this year's uh, distinguished global health lecturer, uh, and that is Dr. Rajiv Shah or Raj Shah. So, of course, DGHI's mission, a part of our core mission, is to try and bring together the leaders in this field, uh, the brightest minds, the people who are making major contributions uh, in the field, uh, to weigh in on some of the really big challenges that we're facing as a global health community. Uh, it's hard to imagine uh, uh, a bigger existential threat to human health, to all of our well-being, to actually the health of every every living thing on our planet than climate, and uh, can't really think of a better person uh, to talk about climate change and global health uh, than Raj. And let me tell you a little bit about why that is. Uh, uh, so first of all, uh, he is a medical doctor, uh, trained as a physician, and then uh, did advanced training in economics. Um, he has had a number of important roles that I'll tell you about, uh, but I think perhaps most importantly has really been somebody who's worked both in the government sector, he was the head of the USAID under President Obama, uh, but also and in uh, under Tom Vilsack as uh, Under Secretary for Agriculture, uh, but also somebody who's really worked in the foundation space and in philanthropy, particularly a very distinguished uh, period of time at the Gates Foundation, leading their agricultural initiatives, and now, of course, serving as president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, 
Under uh, Raj's leadership at Rockefeller, the foundation has committed uh, more than a billion dollars uh, to the discovery and advancement of interventions for climate change. That was, you're supposed to applaud that, by the way. <laughs> Uh, and that, that was just announced at, uh, at COP28. Um, and the foundation has also uh, announced new investments in, in the health impact specifically. Uh, and that is, of course, an incredibly important area for all of us at, at Duke. Um, I would also say uh, that he played very important roles at the Gates Foundation, which is where many of us first got to know him, uh, and really was one of the people who was an architect at the Gates Foundation of Gavi. Uh, that led to a $5 billion investment. That's the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. Uh, and Gavi turned out to be such an important part of the response to COVID-19. Uh, and of course, Raj uh, was able to to uh, pivot the Rockefeller Foundation. That's not easy to do with big institutions. Institutions uh, to respond to COVID-19 as well. Um, he is currently serving on President Biden's Defense Policy Board. He's a member of the Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, and he is also the author of a new book, uh, Big Bets, uh, which is also, of course, somewhat the title uh, of his conversation this evening. Um, and that is really about thinking about, uh, and I've read it, it's a wonderful read, uh, about the ways uh, that it's so important sometimes to really take uh, uh, big steps, uh, think the big thoughts, uh, and make big bets. Uh, and if you think about responding to the, the challenge we face of climate change and global health, uh, it's going to take some big bets. Uh, and with that, let's hear, hear how that works and how it's done by somebody who's done that and succeeded, Raj Shah. Hello, good evening. Uh, thank you, Chris, for that incredibly kind conversation, uh, introduction. It was incredibly kind, and I will say Chris is uh, such an asset to have here at Duke and for the Duke Global Health community. Um, I personally find his prior title to carry uh, an extra moral weight, where he, he was the Desmond Tutu professor. Uh, and so, you know, when, when this guy says something, you gotta really think about it, internalize it, and take it seriously. So, since that was such a kind introduction, I would normally say that was too much, but thank you. <laughs> it feels like it comes with some moral weight when it comes from you. Uh, Victor and Ruth, thank you for uh, your leadership and for supporting, creating this lecture series. Victor. Uh, I assume everybody in this room knows Victor. I assume it's why you're all here. Uh, but Victor is, is uh, in addition to all the amazing things he's done, he's just everywhere. You know, he's at Davos. He's at Dubai for the COP. He's in Rome when he calls. And, and I know the spirit that, that he embodies of bringing people together, of really fighting for the things you care about, of really helping nurture hope and optimism when it's easy to kind of read the media and be quite pessimistic about our collective future. And so, Victor, I'm quite honored to get to give a lecture in your name. Uh, and everything I know about climate and health, I learned from reading Victor's various reports <laughs> and speeches. So we'll see how we do. Uh, Adam, the uh, MBA commissioner, but also an extraordinary leader here in the Duke community. And I would like to say proudly, a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, during COVID, I used to jokingly call him the Secretary of Health and Human Services because I think he did more to help America appreciate the value of science and testing uh, by being science-oriented and bold during that crisis and its response, and, and that was a big part of it. And then a huge shout out and a thank you to, to all of our Duke partners and friends, Mark McClellan, John O'Quick, Jack Leslie. I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, we know the excellence this institution brings. And I see quite a lot of students here. I hope you kind of find these professors when they have free time and really get to spend time with them because they are some extraordinarily talented thinkers and doers. And, and we still rely on the doing today every day through our partnership. So, so thank you. Uh, so let me, let me jump in. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to start just by highlighting that I was here about 10 or 11 years ago when I was running USAID. By the way, I saw a few of our USAID colleagues. Can you just put your hand up? Can we give those folks a round of applause? Where's Paul? Paul, put your hand up. 
And Deborah, I didn't see Deborah's hand. Oh, there she is. Okay, good. These folks do extraordinary work. And I remember coming uh, to the Sanford School. That's Paul right there, by the way, a young Paul Weisenfeld. Uh, but, uh, and, and being wowed by the sense of kind of global interest, uh, compassion and understanding that existed in the student body. And I remember uh, a group of high school students that they brought into that lecture, uh, and they were just like grilling me. And I'm like, who are these guys? <laughs> and how do they know so much? And they're like, oh, we're from the local high school, and we're part of some group that, that comes to campus. And I thought, okay, I'm not coming back for a while. <laughs> but, but here we are. Uh, and, and Victor, this is just to, to celebrate your contribution to, to the space and to say thank you. Uh, so what's a big bet? Well, you know, I, we, uh, those of us that work together on this book, it's a Rockefeller Foundation project. The proceeds go to the foundation, and, and with those proceeds, we're establishing what we call the Big Bet community to help young people get access to opportunities in public service and, and global affairs. But a Big Bet, to me, is very simple. It's when we think of charitable endeavor, we think, well, doing a little bit of good is good enough. That, you know, we want to feel good because we were able to help. In contrast to that, a big bet is actually taking a big, tough, social problem, inequity, a pandemic, a famine, or a food crisis, and doing the hard work to understand what it will take to solve that problem as comprehensively as possible. And to me, that is very different than simply doing the best we can. It's grounded in understanding that actually tackling these challenges is not fundamentally a charitable endeavor. It's a strategy to protect our national security and a strategy to ensure we live up to the basic ideals of what this country was founded on, which every day we have to try to live and make more real. There are three core components to a big bet. The first is really finding those fresh, innovative solutions that make large-scale change possible. I'll talk about vaccines, I'll talk about burial teams and Ebola, I'll talk about other widespread antigen testing in, in the US, but actually do, being disciplined about finding innovations that can transform the human condition is a, is a basic founding principle of the Rockefeller Foundation 110 years ago and remains at the heart of big bets today. A second core component is building unique public-private partnerships, really building all kinds of strange alliances that allow people to work together across the divides. And that, to me, is really what it takes to deliver success at scale. And finally, and most importantly, it's about data, measurement, and having the same rigor in solving global health or global development challenges as you would have in tackling any business endeavor where there's an important bottom line that requires tracking performance and, and adapting. So I didn't invent this methodology, nor did, uh, nor did Bill or Melinda, by the way. Uh, they, you know, they learned it, actually, by, by reading the history of uh, John D. Rockefeller's background and what inspired him to, to create, really, the world's first global philanthropy. But the first big bet I want to talk about is Bill and Melinda's. You know, they read an article, and Melinda, of course, is a, a, both a patron and an alum of this great institution, and so involved in creating some of the capabilities that you, you now have here. Uh, but, but they read an article that said 600,000 kids were going to die of rotavirus in 1999. And in that same article, it pointed out that Merck was going to roll out a vaccine for rotavirus here in the United States. Well, how many of you have had rotavirus? This is a trick question. We've all had rotavirus in this country. But nobody dies of rotavirus in the United States. So they thought, well, isn't it crazy that we are about to introduce a vaccine that's expensive, that will only be available in a community where no one dies, and the 600,000 kids who perish will simply not be protected. And it led to a journey that culminated in a $750 million grant to create the Vaccine Alliance so that every single child everywhere could have full access to vaccines and immunization. This is actually a photo of the learning journey we were on in those early days. We're at the ICDDRB in Bangladesh here, a famous cholera hospital where we learned so much about uh, diarrheal illness and diarrheal disease. 
So back then, uh, this is both, an, I mean, to me, an important slide, but also kind of wildly inaccurate. Uh, back then, people were saying, okay, well, this is, this is how many kids are effectively vaccinated in low to middle income countries. The official data said 76% of kids were vaccinated, which didn't seem right when you thought about the number of deaths that were occurring from these basic uh, diseases for which we had vaccines. And when we dug into the data and we used auditors that we sent into rural health clinics to actually verify immunization logs. Uh, we collected the surveys that were conducted at county level in places like Liberia to ask, is this data real? We actually found that the real answer to that question for the number of people getting protection from vaccine, not just one shot, was, was more like half of that number. And of the 104 million kids born every year at that time, probably half of the global birth cohort was simply not getting access to vaccines and immunizations. So the, the story of creating the Global Vaccine Alliance started actually with, with Bill uh, and Melinda pulling us into a conference room almost every week to ask the same simple question. What does it take to vaccinate a child? What does it cost to vaccinate one single child? And I remember because I was, uh, I was a glorified intern at the table. I uh, found myself unemployed after working on Al Gore's presidential campaign. And, uh, and thankfully, a friend said, uh, Bill and Melinda were looking for somebody who knew a little bit of economics, a little bit of medicine, and a little bit of global uh, global affairs, but not too much of any of those things. And, and I said, I, that sounds like me. Uh, and so I was there. But, but the point was, we'd gather all these experts, like world-renowned experts, and most people would say, well, it's too complex to answer that question. You know, you have to understand what it takes to allow safe syringes to be widely available. You have to invest in roads and refrigeration and cold chain. Uh, we need trained human resources and personnel. And so it's just too hard to say what would it take, and it's too unrealistic to say what would it take to vaccinate every child. But we spent about three years running around trying to kind of build the models that would allow us to know those answers. And I was the person who built some of those models. The reason I say that is because they ended up all being wildly inaccurate. Uh, but that almost didn't matter. What mattered was the point of studying the problem enough to understand what the constraints were gave us a path to solving it. And the biggest constraint at that time was the vaccine market had bifurcated and there was no vaccine supply for 70 countries that were considered low income. So we had to develop unique solutions to that problem. And we did. We actually built a global immunization bond, something called the International Finance Facility for Immunization, based on getting a group of European countries together to make long-term conditional commitments to the Vaccine Alliance, and we issued really the world's first social impact bond. It was a six billion, five and a half billion dollar bond issuance. Uh, that was a particularly unique project because uh, I was part of a small group that kind of wrote the memo to propose that project to Bill. And the first time I met with him to talk about it one-on-one, -on -one, it was actually my first meeting with Bill one-on-one -on, -one on a kind of business issue. Uh, it was at his suite at the Pierre in New York. And I, uh, I got up there and I was a little bit nervous. What my boss, Sylvia Burwell, Sylvia Matthews at the time, said, Raj, whatever you do, don't take your BlackBerry up there because he'll, you know, it was back when Microsoft had a handheld device that was competitive. Uh, so I left my BlackBerry at the concierge. I go upstairs. Uh, I sit down. I'm like ready to have this conversation. Bill pulls out my memo and it's like covered in ink. And he starts with, you know, this is the stupidest thing I've literally ever seen. Uh, and, and, but we have like a one hour in-depth conversation uh, where he rightfully pointed out many of the shortcomings and we spent three years using that as a roadmap to create a bond structure that would actually work. When we issued the debt, uh, it sold on capital markets. We were able to use the proceeds to do some unique advanced contracting with Serum Institute of India and other large-scale manufacturers to help them build their manufacturing base. And the result was, uh, was Gavi kind of got a jump start in actually solving global immunization. And the reality is over 20 years, $21 billion raised, thousands of partners around the world working together on that basic simple question yielded 980 million kids vaccinated 
and 16 million child lives saved. And I, like many of you, have been in Kabul or the Democratic Republic of Congo or part of Honduras where you've sat with a family who's lost a child from a simple disease, usually under the age of five. And so you know how powerful it is to have saved 16 million child lives. And to me, that's an example of a big bet that works. And the lesson I take away is it is easy to say something is too complex. It is easy, Wendy, Paul, you guys remember all this when we were in government. It's easy to say, oh, that's a great idea, but Congress will never go for it. I mean, there, there are always so many reasons why things won't work. I see so many students here today. I would just encourage you to be the person who forces the simplicity, asks the simple questions, and insists on building a strategy for how we're going to get to yes. The second big bet I'd like to talk about is also not mine. It is, uh, it, it is really President Obama's big bet. But, and I apologize for the nature of the photograph, uh, but this young boy is perishing from Ebola, a hemorrhagic fever, in the summer of 2014 on the streets of Monrovia. And to understand how tragic that crisis was, we now know what a pandemic is broadly. I mean, you all are health people, you knew, but even the general public now knows. At that time, seven out of every 10 people infected in the summer of 2014 were dying of Ebola. Seven out of 10. 50% of the Liberian healthcare workforce, almost all women and mostly community health workers, died in an eight-week period in June and July of 2014. A previously small rural outbreak had basically mutated into a roaring urban pandemic and very little was working to tackle that crisis. Humanitarian workers actually couldn't go in. We had the phone calls, and a Duke alum that we all love and take inspiration from, Paul Farmer, was part of a little group we pulled together and we all constantly called every humanitarian organization we could. No one other than Medicine Sans Frontier had the ability to send in healthcare workers or humanitarian workers safely, and even MSF, had hit their limit in their ability to train and protect people on the ground. So it was in that context that, Paul, that Tom uh, Frieden, who's the CDC director at the time, issued a report that said we were likely to have 1.4 million cases of Ebola, including potentially tens of thousands in the United States. In that context, President Obama, about 10 weeks, 11 or 12 weeks before a midterm election, in the heat of a real political debate, made the decision for the first time in US history to deploy nearly 2,500 American troops to fight a disease on foreign soil. Those troops were deployed before we actually knew which technical solutions would work to beat back the disease. They were deployed, Marty Dempsey is in that photo, he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. They were deployed in a very negotiated protocol to build the kind of hospital infrastructure and Ebola treatment unit infrastructure so that if healthcare workers and humanitarian workers got sick, they had some better chance of survival than the 70% mortality rate that existed. And I can tell you, it was at the table obviously through all of that, that we were terrified that in fact if we lost a single American service worker, that the, in addition to that being a tragic outcome, the political forces led by a governor in New Jersey, Chris Christie, who was quarantining people who were coming back and forth, including some of our humanitarian partners, uh, and a new political voice on the stage, Donald Trump, would in fact succeed at overwhelming our capacity to sustain America's support for this endeavor. So what happened? Well, to me, this was a big bet in action. The first thing we did was we deployed the troops, built some infrastructure so we could be safe on the ground. And I visited to oversee that response in October of 2014. The second thing we did was, it was even more critical, which is we built a data infrastructure in, oh, no, the second thing we did was actually also critical. We, we had the military partnered with MSF to create a training protocol and started training thousands of local workers in how to be safe 
while supporting the Ebola response. And for those of you that know the history, that's an extraordinary partnership that took a lot of negotiation. And I give Marty Dempsey so much credit for this because MSF's kind of core ethic for decades has been to be as far away from militaries as you possibly could be. Um, and in this case, we all held hands together and, and actually we were training folks in the stadium in Monrovia where they would normally have soccer matches. But the most important thing we did was build a data infrastructure that allowed us to have real-time data, even if imperfect, to know what was going on. And I'll gotta tell you, we did everything to make that happen. We called Hans Rosling. Do any of you remember Hans? God bless him. Uh, we called Hans into action from Sweden. He sat in the emergency operations center. We deployed a team of epidemiologists around him. We invested in standing up technology system so that people could relay data via SMS text on the ground. We put young men on motorbikes and sent them into villages to do visual confirmation of cases. We deployed bioterror labs throughout the country to have rapid uh, diagnostic validation of potential positive cases. And we even transported blood samples on World Food Program helicopters to take the validation time down from several days to several hours so we could know if a case was positive or not. That data system allowed us to start understanding what was working and what wasn't working. What wasn't working was everything we were doing. Building Ebola treatment units, when there's 70% mortality, people go into those units, they never come out, their possessions never came out, their ashes never came out, and so very quickly, nobody went in. What, what did work ultimately came from local communities. In fact, a group called Global Communities that have been working in rural settings. And it turns out that it was the washing and the kissing and the dressing of those who had been deceased was the main point of contagion for the next generation of people infected. And so we worked with communities to design these burial teams that would go in fully clad with body bags, perform a ceremony, uh, respect the tradition of those local families, but remove the body before infection could happen. Scaled that up quickly because we saw it was working, and the result is that peak in October of 2014 came very quickly down. And instead of having 1.4 million cases, we had 30,000. And instead of having tens of thousands in the United States, we had two and no transmission on U.S. soil. And I tell the story because, to me, a big bet starts and ends with discipline around data and measurement, but it also includes having all of those partners working together, the military and MSF, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the president of Liberia, and local NGOs, local community leaders, Firestone, a company that gave us a thousand employees to train and deploy to fight a health response. And I think sometimes we think of health as something people who are trained in health do, and almost every big bet I've been a part of in global health actually takes, it takes all of us to make a huge difference. I, in the book, I call that uh, keep experimenting because we really didn't know what would work when we deployed our troops. And we fought a lot, frankly, at the National Security Council about which strategies would work. Uh, and we only overcame the fighting by creating a scorecard and tracking with data what was working and what, what isn't. Uh, but it is important, even in the heat of crisis, that we keep experimenting. The next big bet I want to tell is an American story and a more recent one. This is a, a student outside of a, locked out of a school uh, at, during COVID uh, in New York City. And what is unbelievable about, uh, about our COVID response as a country is, and Jono uh, was, is the one who basically taught me this, but America was, was supposed to be the best prepared country to address a pandemic threat. We by far spend more money than any other country on our healthcare, and yet none of those things came together to help us overcome the fact that America had more excess mortality from COVID-19 than any other country on earth. And so we ask ourselves why and what ultimately made a difference. But when Ebola hit, we were shut down. Uh, I think actually, Adam, is probably the MBA that helped people understand this was gonna be serious because you, you closed down the games first and that really affected the consciousness of, of everybody 
which is why I was calling Adam the Secretary of Health during that period of time. Uh, so we, we, what we did at Rockefeller is what we have the luxury of getting to do because our predecessors did productive things for 110 years, and that is use that platform to bring together smart, capable people to figure out how we would craft a response. And we had a quick call with Tony on the very early part of that pandemic. Jono was leading this effort, Jono Quick, from, uh, on behalf of the Rockefeller Foundation. And the question was, what's the most important thing we could do in this moment on behalf of our country? And the answer was effectively scaling up diagnostic testing capacity. If you remember, in April of 2020, America was doing about 300 or 350,000 tests per week. Almost all of them were PCR tests, which is a wonderful gold standard. But it was taking four to six days for people to get a response on whether they were positive or not. And in that period of time, the uh, pandemic was exploding, which was why we had to be locked down in our homes and shut out of our schools. So in that context, we came together and developed for the country a testing action plan. We put real money against it. We set some targets. Of, we called it the 1330 plan to quickly get to 1 million, then 3 million, then 30 million tests per week. Uh, we felt at 30 million tests per week, there'd be enough diagnostic capability that we could avoid the lockdowns, reopen the schools, and be back to functioning safely in society. Uh, we came up with a legislative plan to get it funded and financed. We developed partnerships with probably about 40 local partners in, from Navajo Nation to the city of Los Angeles to uh, the police department in Detroit that was trying to figure out how to safely get officers back in their cars patrolling the streets. And, and this effort ultimately led to, in my view, a, a tremendous uh, standing up of the public-private infrastructure that created the antigen testing market in particular, the rapid tests we still use today. And I'll just remind us that when, when John and his colleagues kind of invented this strategy, uh, it was by no means guaranteed that antigen testing would be accepted. In fact, the CDC said it wasn't a viable. Most American institutions said we had to follow the CDC's guidance. And there were no real protocols on how to use antigen and rapid testing to reopen institutions. So we, as we were prone to do, we turned to Duke and the Margolis Center. I don't know if Mark McClellan is here tonight, but we turned to Mark and his team. And they developed the guidelines, uh, which he never allowed us to call guidelines. He just said, Raj, you can't call them guidelines. They're only the CDC can issue guidelines. I'm like, Mark, issue the damn guidelines. Like, you, <laughs> without you, we don't have anything. Uh, and, and we conducted uh, tests, I think. On, we, we actually uh, used those guidelines to help reopen schools, uh, covering about 100,000 kids and teachers and administrators. We used RAND uh, and Mathematica, I believe, to study the impact and safety of that large-scale diagnostic test. We partnered with, we actually created a $100 million guarantee pool to support states to start buying those diagnostic tests to create a market. We were talking to Becton Dickinson and other firms on a regular basis about what it would take. And we partnered with Larry Hogan, the governor of Maryland, but also the head of the National Governors Association. We said, look, if our president right now is saying we shouldn't test because more tests means more positives. More positives is a bad thing, so we shouldn't test. Uh, we, need a, we need governors to stand up. And Larry pretty quickly put together five Republican, five Democratic governors, and we launched the State and Territorial Alliance for Testing, which ultimately grew to include all 50 states and territories. And, and we launched uh, the first effort actually in Maryland with a five, seven and a half million dollar procurement of Becton Dickinson tests um, that Larry is announcing here. But the point is, uh, even without real federal action, between the Margolis Center and the development of protocols, between the tests and the data coming out of the schools with RAND and Mathematica, with uh, efforts to use the states as procurement engines and a foundation as a guarantor to start to create an at-scale volume market for the product, we were able to ultimately launch the, the testing, the antigen testing market, and then, and then Brett Girard, who was the Assistant Secretary of Health, came in and, and made a, a big $750 million procurement that cemented that as a strategy for our country. 
so when so I just want to show you that when when we did the one three thirty test plan, a lot of folks thought that was completely not credible, including some of the most famous public health scientists in this country who we deeply respect. Uh, and we did that in April. Uh, but by the summer, the late summer, uh, we were successful at that. The reason I, I, highlight the, I keep highlighting the MBA is, is I do feel like you know, public sentiment and people's understanding of what you're doing uh, doesn't just come from public health experts. I think if we haven't learned that yet <laughs> in fighting pandemics, we never will. And at least in my view, we're a, we're a pro MBA family. We consume a lot of MBA, but but the, both the shutting down the games and then creating the bubble and showing people you could use testing and and certain strategies to keep people safe really did help change the consciousness of people accepting that as a core strategy. And I. I think that's a challenge to all of us as we go forward because misinformation and people's understanding of information is so mixed these days that we have to really rely not just on health partners but you know, cultural institutions that define the way people think. And that's an important part of transforming health and global health. The lesson I learned from that experience was pivot. My colleagues at the Rockefeller Foundation had the courage to shut down tens of millions of dollars of grants and move money very quickly into a national testing strategy for our country. And if anyone's ever been in that dialogue, it's the worst thing in the world to have to tell UNICEF to not spend money on something that's helping you know, kids somewhere in the world. It, it's, just, it's just very, very difficult to do. Uh, but they did it. And it's not just pivoting our institution. It was really pivoting the political support in Congress and across the governors and the mayors that I think ultimately made a difference. And, and so as we take on big bets, innovative solutions like rapid testing, unique partnerships, public-private, left-right, like the Testing Alliance, and ultimately measuring results are the key to driving success. So lest you think this is a methodology we've like invented, I just wanted to show you. This is a, uh, a flyer we found in our archives uh, from the Durham County Division of the General Education Board. The General Education Board was the very first project the Rockefeller Foundation created to improve public health, science-based public health in America. And it was created in the early 1900s. I think this is from 1915. And the goal was to fight hookworm because 40% of kids in the American South had hookworm. And, uh, and you know, they made a big bet then that new treatments and new science could transform the kids in this part of the world and help them perform better in school and not be plagued by this persistent debilitating disease that caused kind of chronic fatigue and low learning and all of that. And I say that because, you know, I wrote, we wrote the book Big, Big Bets because, and we call it that because the editors thought it was sort of catchy. Uh, what, what John D. Rockefeller called this type of philanthropy back in 1901 was scientific philanthropy. He said, find those scientific in innovations that can make a big difference and then make sure they reach the people who otherwise don't get reached. Ultimately, Rockefeller's legacy yielded America's county-based public health system many decades later, and even the early predecessors to the CDC. All right, so what is the state of public health today? Well, I just wanted to focus a little bit on global health and global affairs, uh, because frankly, I'm quite worried that after 20 years of extraordinary progress in improving the human condition because of vaccines, because we were able to fight pandemic threats, because we had huge reductions in death and disability around malaria, TB, and HIV, that we've stalled and actually reversed progress. And this uh, slide is not the most effective way to communicate to a large group. I apologize for that. Uh, but it does show, if you look at the numbers, the rates of change are quite dramatic, and, and they have been quite dramatic, and from 2000 to 2015, we saw the, the fastest reduction in maternal mortality, fastest reduction in infant and child mortality. A lot of those numbers are now plateauing or even reversing. And it is, uh, I think, if you're passionate about health, you're passionate about global health, and you're passionate about public health, you have to recognize that you're now swimming 
uh, upstream in terms of trying to deliver results. And it's going to require more big bets, more innovation, more commitment, and frankly, more of a political voice to re-energize the, the sort of political fight we had uh, to, to establish the resourcing that drove some of the progress here. So I won't get into the details, but I, I, I promise you that we're in a different era and we need a different kind of politics and leadership to deliver success. It's not just health outcomes narrowly defined. Um, actually, we, we work as a foundation on food, food insecurity, malnutrition. We all know that 65% of child mortality related to infectious disease is actually an underlying signal around deep micronutrient malnutrition. And I am particularly concerned that the fight against food insecurity is now going the wrong way. You know, between 2000 and 2015, we saw a huge reduction in food insecurity, down to ultimately about 6-7% of the total global population being food insecure in 2015. And it was that trend line that many of us used when we negotiated the SDGs and said we could have zero hunger by 2030. Zero is never zero, it was always basically 2% instead of 7%. But, but we used the trend lines of that 15-year window of the Millennium Development Goals to set targets for the 2030 goals on all of these indicators. And we're now way, way off trend. Food insecurity in particular because of climate change and some other pressures is likely to be hugely off trend, so much so that in 20 years, 14% of the global population is now at, at risk of being chronically food insecure. On top of that, uh, we are currently living through a debt crisis in developing and emerging economies that is as bad as any since 1998 and 1999, at a time when countries were uh, collapsing under the weight of foreign debt so aggressively that uh, the Jubilee movement came together, created the highly indebted Poor Country Initiative, and redirected tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars of debt into the very health programs that drove the results that you just saw. And we're seeing that again right now. This is a photo of the conflict and the violence that came with tax increases that were just introduced in Kenya. When I was in Kenya a few months ago, I learned from President Ruto that 68 cents on the dollar is spent now in debt repayment. And the reason is when we invested in protecting the American economy and the Euro Europeans did the same, the Chinese did the same during COVID, we put trillions of dollars of fiscal and monetary policy support into those economies. That created inflation. That created a response, which is raising rates. And roughly, uh, you get a three to one reaction. Rates go up by a factor of three in developing and emerging economies when they go up by a factor of one here. And that's what ultimately caused the crisis. To make it even more inequitable, consider this. While we put 20 to 25% of GDP into our economy to protect the vulnerable and to recover from COVID, 72 developing countries, the IDA countries, did a total of 2% of their GDP. So they never even got the stimulus bounce of that particular public investment. So we're living in an era that I think is going to be challenged from a health uh, perspective and from a social services perspective, from a food and food insecurity perspective. Uh, and to make matters worse, uh, we now know that the consequence of climate change is absolutely significant, not just for underlying food and food insecurity, but also for so many different elements of health and human well-being. Uh, and I, I just want to thank in particular the, the leadership here at Duke. I mean, what you've done on climate is setting the tone and the bar for all the rest of us to follow. It's extraordinarily impressive. Uh, we know that we'll have tremendous infectious disease threats that go up and change in their basic nature because of climate change. We know the kinds of mosquitoes that thrive in different types of environments will change and therefore we'll be fighting malaria in different places, dengue much more aggressively, probably Zika again in, in a much bigger way. And we know that we're not prepared to do the surveillance and the response, especially in the places that are going to be hardest hit. We also know now, I think thanks to Duke, that, that there are going to be non-communicable disease consequences like, uh, like 
I want to say it right, but CKDU, so chronic kidney disease of unknown origin. Uh, and, you know, these areas will require surveillance, science, developing interventions that can make a huge difference. And so I won't go into the complex element of this. If you want to know more, read uh, Victor's Lancet report and <laughs> these other studies that have, have sort of really detailed out the potential consequences. I will say, by the way, since we're at a university for a university community, studying those consequences and modeling them with more specificity is absolutely essential. It is not okay just to say infectious disease threat will go up and change. We actually need to know which diseases in which communities in which places and what are the environmental protection investments we need to make, where do we need to make them? And sometimes uh, we get, you know, we get papers published by just the basic insight, but the response for policymakers to respond, you need much more granularity and specificity. Okay, so that was all a little bit negative, and I um, apologize for that, so I'd like to close with a few uh, elements of, of big bets that inspire me that we can get back on track in health and in improvements in human welfare. Uh, right now, the foundation is involved in several big bets. One, uh, I'll just pick a few so I don't, don't take too much time, but one, one is around food as medicine. We, we were here actually in the Durham area this morning with some of our partners, reinvestment partners. I don't know if any of you are here today, but I'm so proud of what they're doing. The bottom line is we conduct 130,000 amputations a year in this country for people who have had late stage diabetes. That's more than all wars America has fought since Vietnam. We do that every single year. And we know that diabetes is a disease caused by diet, caused by access to food, caused by lifestyle and levels of activity. And we know how to prevent it. And what we're showing with partners here in North Carolina, but also all around the country, is by providing targeted feeding programs and food, actual free food, to families and to individuals who are pre-diabetic and, and food insecure, you can quickly reduce their hemoglobin A1C levels and get them to a place where they are, increase them and get them to a place where they're protected from being diabetic. The same is true of hypertension and a number of other metabolic disease endpoints. And so we are now engaged with the American Heart Association. As of today, the Health and Human, uh, HHS, the Health and Human Services Department, uh, and many, many other public and private partners to conduct large-scale studies to show that food-based interventions in targeted populations can reduce the long-term consequences of diabetes, heart disease, and other chronic illnesses. And I think that insight and the data that will substantiate it has the potential to change the way America tackles chronic disease. We've made a big bet on restructuring global finance and redefining the purpose and the presence of the Bretton Woods institutions. These are global financial institutions that were created uh, 80, 90 years ago after World War II. And I won't get into the details, but uh, we've actually helped our partners mobilize $40, 50000000000 billion of additional investment in just the last few years by changing capital requirements in the public banks that are tasked with the mission of supporting health and food and energy access around the world, and in introducing something called special drawing rights, uh, which is not worth talking about, but it is worth doing because it generates liquidity for countries at a time of real crisis. To put that in perspective, the, the highly indebted poor country initiative was hundreds of billions of dollars, and that was 20 years ago. And if we're going to be serious about avoiding huge backsliding in human development outcomes around the world, we have to think at that much bigger scale. Uh, finally, our, our single biggest effort at the foundation is investing in renewable electrification for 81 countries around the world that contain the 3.5 billion people that consume one-twelfth of the power each of you do here in the United States and are dependent on coal and diesel backup generation to power their lives and their economies. And the problem with that is not just the carbon pollution, but it sure is the carbon pollution. In fact, those countries, 15 years from now, will account for 75% of all global carbon emissions if the US, Europe, and China live up to the policy commitments they've already made and make no new ones to fight climate change. So we'll fail on the fight against climate change without, without them in the fight. But the real threat is also that you can't 
you can't thrive. Uh, there are a billion people that live in energy poverty. They consume less power than it takes to power one light bulb and one small appliance per person per year. They have diesel backup that costs six times the cost of even what you can do with solar mini grids. And whether we're powering health facilities or powering entire townships in Eastern Congo, we've now partnered with private sector developers and companies, operators, and we're invested in projects to reach 77 million people in 22 countries, basically with solar mini grids or, or solar metro grids through the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. Uh, this is a grant uh, that we made to SERI uh, in South Africa to help support pandemic prevention and disease surveillance. You'll remember this group because they're the ones that documented uh, the Omicron variant and its genetic uh, content and made that public for the world about four or five weeks before the CDC and other public institutions did. And I, I wanted to tell this story because they did this, it was heroic, we're very proud of them. The, the thank you they got from the rest of the world, of course, were countries stopped flights from South Africa uh, and you know they paid a price for that. Uh, but I wanted to include this because if we're going to be serious about preventing the next pandemic and winning the fight against these, all these new threats for global health that climate change is causing, we have to do surveillance in a way that is different, that has defined by partnership, data sharing, and that is fundamentally non-political. And, uh, and we hope you and others will come together to make that real. It, when we talk to folks around the world about diseases and climate change, uh, this is what we heard. Uh, they said infectious disease is now the problem, that timely warning is needed, that funding is limited and inaccessible. And this is true even after a COVID pandemic that killed more than 20 million people. It's sort of unfathomable to me that we don't have the ability as a G20 or a G7 or, or, or public cooperation to produce the few billion dollars a year it would take to build an extraordinary platform for global surveillance but it's what everybody's asking for. Uh, Naveen Rao, Dr. Naveen Rao leads our global health platform and is in the process of working with nations to build out what he's calling climate and health observatories. And it's grounded in the idea that if we can improve the way we do surveillance, this is a, a project we support in Karnataka, uh, tracking dengue, but doing it using predictive modeling and with an artificial intelligence partner in India, helping us do that, that you can actually inform community workers and communities that are at risk before disease outbreaks happen. And in a micro spatial way, neighborhood by neighborhood, help people protect themselves before they get sick. This is the kind of solution that's gonna have to power our fight against global, uh, our fight for global health in a context of climate change. And we would very much invite anyone here to partner with us to help make these climate and health observatories a big part of global disease surveillance going forward. Uh, I wanted to conclude with a, a recognition of a Duke alum, Dr. Paul Farmer, uh, for representing, I think, uh, an idea that hopefully brings us all together this evening in Victor's honor. This is uh, uh, the hospital in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, that uh, Paul built during the Haiti earthquake. And, you know, Paul Farmer, or not Paul Farmer, Paul Weisenfeld is here. Paul, where are you? Put your hand up. Paul Weisenfeld was the lead USAID coordinator for the earthquake response in Haiti. And his working tirelessly day after day after day helped save tens of thousands of lives and support so many communities. But one of the things he did was he helped find the funding and build the partnership that resulted in, in our ability to build out this hospital. You know, Paul, uh, in those early days of the crisis response, when 21 of 22 ministries in Port-au-Prince had collapsed, the United Nations had collapsed, 250,000 people perished, we didn't really know what we were gonna be able to do. Quickly stood up an effort to feed three million people, quickly stood up an effort to bring clean water, enough clean water so that six months after the earthquake, the diarrheal illness rate was lower than the day before the earthquake. We're doing all this stuff, and in the midst of it, Paul kept calling and saying, if you spend all your money on immediate humanitarian relief, we'll miss an opportunity to really build something that demonstrates what health equity is all about. So we found him some resources, he built this hospital, 
And I remember taking my son there before I left uh, government service. And we walked through with Paul, the hospital. This is obviously the neonatal uh, infant care unit. And he took so much pride in the fact that this unit was as good or better than any NICU across this country in the United States. And I thought it's appropriate to close on that theme because it's easy to be overwhelmed by the challenges we face. Uh, but if we can remember that even in the midst of destruction and death and tragedy, you can do things that really do represent equity and kindness and courage and make a huge, huge difference. Uh, so that's in recognition of Paul. That's also at the hospital. Uh, and that last message is really for those of you, I think this is the class from the, the, the Global Health Institute from last year. Uh, we're just so dependent on the optimism and the courage and the commitment that you all bring as students. Uh, stay optimistic, stay courageous, be bold. When you get your jobs and you go into places like Rockefeller or USAID or wherever you end up, uh, just remember, you have to be the ones that ask the simple questions. You have to be the ones that insist that we make big bets and not just do a little bit of good. And you have to be the ones that live up to the story that Paul gives us. Thank you. Can we take some questions?